Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you may be in the world. I know we have some Aussie viewers who have tuned in and I know you've had to get up really early. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I am Sue Ann Braun and this is Hathor Hosts. Uh, I would, before we sort of introduce the guest, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you like what you see, please click the like button as it really helps with YouTube's algorithms and all those things. Subscribe to the channel so you can find out who's coming up next. And generally, let's just spread the word, the Stargate love, because that is what I am here for. I am your goddess and I am here to serve you. <laughs> also, I'd like to remind everyone, if you don't mind, just trying to hold on till the end of the show to ask your questions. We have a ton to get through tonight. And also we have a slight time constraint because our guest has to rush off. So 
We're going to go quickly. Uh, not too quickly, though. We're going to do our best to get through everything. My guest tonight is truly prolific in every sense of the word. Chances are, if you have a TV, have been to the cinema, or streamed anything in the last 20 years, you will have seen him in one thing or many more. Not only has he defied genres, he's played in everything from sci-fi, comedy, psychotic killers, he can do it all. He's also a happily married, wonderful family man and a hell of a nice guy. I cannot tell you what a great pleasure it is for me to say, bonsoir et bonjour et bienvenue, Mike Dopod. Merci beaucoup, merci. Wow, <laughs> what, what an introduction. Thank you so much. I'm blushing. Uh, well, that's, that's what my aim is, to make you blush. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to jump right on in. And as I said to you just before we went live, because there is so much ground to cover with your remarkable career that continues to go from strength to strength, I'm happy to say, um, I'm going to be jumping around chronologically quite a bit. So we'll dip in and out of selected credits. Great. What I'd like to do now is I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, you were born Michel Dopuch, is that correct? Yes, very, very good. Um, it's a Serbian name. Uh, well, Yugoslavian, we used to say, because back then it was the, the former Yugoslavia. And my parents defected from Yugoslavia and moved to France, to Paris more specifically. And when they got there, you know, my dad was, he went alone. And when he got there, they said, uh, well, we don't have that letter in the alphabet. It's, it's like a D with a line through it and, and right. uh, it's a J sound. So then they said, uh, vous voulez un D, on va mettre un D, which we'll put a D. And then sure enough, my dad's like, yeah, whatever, just let me, let me get out of here. So, <laughs> and so what made your parents, did. sorry, say again? And that's what they did. That's why my dad, he just wanted to get out of Yugoslavia. Um, I, I think, uh, um, Basically, it was because it was a communist country. Yeah. And, and I think with all the weapons, my dad was, even though he was in the army and, you know, a, a captain for some time and did a lot of work uh, in the army, he, he was against guns so, uh, and weapons and, and such. So um, I guess he decided Paris was the place to go. Um, it all came abruptly, I think, if I remember correctly. But, well, my parents, the way they told me, so. Right. So what made them decide to settle in Montreal then, in, in Canada? What was... Um, I think because it was one of the only other French-speaking places that they had thought of or, or were able mm -hmm. to get to. And they'd heard wonderful things about Canada. So especially back then, they just, you know, people would talk and, okay, you know, we didn't have the internet or anything else to, to yeah. go. So they just decided, okay, it sounds good. Although they... My mom often reminds me that uh, how cold it was that first winter. They couldn't believe how cold it was. Yeah, I can imagine. Big, big shock and a rude awakening. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. what were you like as a young boy? <laughs> I was uh, very shy. Um, big fan of my brother's. It was like he's seven years older than I am. And uh, so I would go to every single sporting event. He was very much into sports. And my dad was a former pro soccer player. So um, for us, it was sports all the time. And, um, and yeah, just, you know, I was always with my brother. We had a small family. It was just us, my mom, uh, my older brother, myself, and my dad. And uh, we were alone in St. Michel, Quebec, which is why they named me Michel, by the way. Ah. Uh, I was born. And... Um, yeah, it was basically, we were a small, small knit family and that's how we grew up. You told a, a really lovely, charming story when you were on the YVR podcast with the fabulous Sabrina Ferminger. Uh, yes. And that was, and I just can't get this image out of my head of you as this little boy in a blue corduroy suit with <laughs> kind of dodgy teeth. <laughs> oh my you God. Know, sort of not quite as well put together as we see today. <laughs> but it did teach you a very valuable life lesson, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. It it, <laughs> it was amazing. My parents, you know, uh, my father's passed away. It's been over 20 years now, but <laughs> he was, uh, God bless his soul. He tried his best. He thought this is, you know, we, I, we went to a public school and yeah. figured, well, no, we have to put our kids in, in suits. <laughs> and it was like a, either a corduroy suit or just this blue checkered suit. And he'd put our names, our, on on it and so everybody would just oh. make fun of us 
Yeah, it was, and and my teeth. Oh, that's a good story in itself. At that time, I was watching my brother in baseball, and mm-hmm. I was by the fence, and sure enough, there was a foul ball. I can't remember who it was, but it went right in my face and broke all my teeth. But oh. we, were, we were poor, so at the time, they were just like, "Oh well, you'll get over it." <laughs> and so I did for years without, you know, until you know, cavities, until things started falling out, and and uh, then I had to go get them fixed. But yeah, that was a uh, Duckly duckling, I, I'd like to refer to him as. But you know what? It was it was fine. It didn't bother me. I don't think I grew up with any, um, I guess, added stress in my life or or insecurities. It was what it was. And, you know, as, as you know, with, I don't know, if you, with Eastern European parents, they often just, this is the way life is, just deal with it. And mm-hmm. especially we're immigrants, so this is it. Just deal with it. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's how- but I love that because I think it instilled in you something that is very prevalent throughout your life and your career, which I'm going to touch on in a bit. The other valuable lesson that you learned is that, of course, you were sitting sitting duck for these kids who teased you. But you yes. learned to fight and yes. you learned to defend yourself and then discovered in this process that actually you had some athletic ability and that you were quite gifted and talented. So much so that when you graduated high school, you were drafted to the Pro Football League in Canada, playing for a brief while, I know, but still playing pro football for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. God, I'm glad I said that right. (laughs) Well done. done. Um, What is it about football that you love so much? I I think, um, I know for the most part growing up, when I made my decision between hockey and football, uh, it was really something that I just fell in love with. It was a sport that I, I love the competitive aspect of it. I love the hitting, the physical uh, aspect of it. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I think, you know, obviously it helps when, when you, you do something and you end up being pretty good at it. And, uh, and the accolades that come with it, all of a sudden you start feeding off of it and you're like, oh, I love this. But I really, truly enjoyed the sport. Um, and yeah, I gave it my all. Once I decided to play football, I, I did everything I could to be as good a football player as I could be. Uh, so yeah. I, mean, I, I would spend nights trying to, you know, get paper clippings and, and download, you know, VHS tapes and try to dub them so I could send tapes to these major universities in the United States so I could get a scholarship. I was trying to get a scholarship, which eventually I did. But yeah, it was it was amazing. I really just loved the sport so much. But this is, uh, as I said earlier, a pattern of displaying this um, grit and determination to succeed to whatever you put your mind to is a recurring theme in your life and your career. And I wondered where that strong sense of self comes from. I mean, perhaps from your parents, as you said, who were kind of like, just deal with it and make it happen. Yes. And and yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, I, Obviously, my father was a major influence for me. And my brother as well, because he was so much older than I was. And mm-hmm. my brother was a great athlete. So I always aspired to be as good as him. Um, and, and my dad just always said, you don't wait for anybody. You have to go get it. Nobody's going to give you anything. Nobody's going to give you, you know, you have to fight for every everything you get in life. And I sort of still have that, uh, I guess, philosophy. Um, yeah. it, you know, you sit around and wait. Nothing's going to happen. You yeah. have to go get it. And you have to show people what you can do because people won't know unless you show them, I think. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. And and sometimes you don't get that opportunity, which is the hardest part. That's yeah. why as I've gotten older, um, even though I had short careers in, in football and I, I played some high-level hockey as well, I realized how lucky I was because a lot of people didn't even get an opportunity. And they mm-hmm. were just as good, if not better than me. I know some great athletes out there that were amazing. And they never even got an opportunity. So, you know, I was very, and look, you get injuries, certain things happen, whatever. But at least you, you put, I put myself out there and some good things happened. Yeah. And interestingly, when your uh, sports career, your pro sports career was cut short from an injury, you worked in the corporate world for a little bit, decided mm-hmm. that was not for you. And then you decide, logical leap, not. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> and I know you and your brother used to play when you were smaller, um, used to reenact scenes from Mad Max and Blade Runner, which yeah. the film has obviously influenced you greatly. So the love of movies was there. But what made you decide to go, I'm going to be an actor. I have zero training. I have zero idea how, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, it was, 
I think um, because my sports career was cut short and then I tried the corporate world and, and at the end of the day, it wasn't for me. I was doing fine, but I was missing something. I, uh, and, and then, you know, did some research in the film industry. I, I met some actors, uh, like actors that had just started. So I didn't really, I don't think they've ever done anything else, but the way they were describing the film industry and being on set and, I just thought, wow, this is great. I'd love to to do that. And how do I do that? I, I you know, I always wanted to, and I always did drama in schools, uh, in high school, and such. And I loved it. But I always thought you had to go to a university, and then you had to study and go do theater in London to become an actor. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. for me, it was um, I just didn't know how to go about it. And then finally, I just researching and talking to people. I'm like, you know what? This is something I'd like to do. And I did meet an agent that said, you know, it doesn't hurt when somebody said, hey, you got a great look or you've got this kind of look that might work and you're a physical guy and you're an ex-athlete that might help you. And, and I said, oh, OK, so let me try it. And I did. Yeah. I absolutely love the story of when you was at the union that you went yes. to and you just walked in. Please share that story with people. Yes. Oh, my God. I said I want to be an actor. And so you know, I was asking people and they're like, well, you should probably go to union or, or union office and ask them and they'll tell you what agents are good or, or and such. So I said, okay. And uh, so I literally walked in to the union offices and said, hi there. Uh, my name is Mike Dopud. I would, uh, I want to become an actor. Now, who's the best agent? Who, where do I get headshots? Where do I do this? Yeah. And they looked at me and laughed, literally laughed like, I, oh, you're serious. I said, yeah, I'm serious. Well, this is what yeah. I want to do. Oh, uh, Okay, then. And then they just gave me a list of agents. They couldn't say who was the best agent or they're probably sitting yeah. there. He's never going to get with an agent. He doesn't have any experience. Although I did, I did have some experience at the time um, be, through sports, doing some commercials and such. So, right. uh, but yeah, they was literally that and they laughed at me and I said, no, I'm dead serious. I, I want to become an actor. And he said, okay, well, here's all the info you need. You need <laughs> to get six credits or whatever it was to become a union member. And so, yeah. Well, who's laughing now? Yes, I know, right? <laughs> Do you remember your very first professional audition at all? Uh, no, because I had a couple at the same time. It was kind of a, and I do remember when he was actually with this, this creepy guy. It was for a fitness commercial. Right. And, and then, you know, it was the kind of thing, literally, that you hear. And I've never, I don't think I've ever told anybody this, but it was literally one of those things where they're like, Okay, so now uh, can you take off your, your sweatshirt and put on, uh, you know, let's, let's see your tank top. Okay. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, can you take your tank top off? I said, okay, wait a second here. <laughs> what are we <laughs> talking about a product? Not, you know, uh, well, we just want to yeah. make sure that you're in shape. And it was this weird dude. So literally after I, I was like, you know what? I don't think this is going to work out. And then I, I left. It just, I knew then I'm like, okay, this, this felt weird to me. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had some other ones and you know, there were times, gosh, looking back, you think about how bad I was at some of my auditions, just not knowing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you sit there and you do it. And most people, you know, I was 26, I think, or 27 or whatever it was. So you'd think that most people at that age have had some experience. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I remember breathing and feeling weird and trying to get the lines and not remembering the lines and just looking at my paper. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So I that fear is just when it takes over your body. I mean, yeah. I've had a few, uh, not so many acting auditions, but singing auditions. I get so nervous and I find it so difficult to keep that, you know, because your body does go into fight or flight. Yeah. Um, to kind it's of amazing. keep that thing of going, no, I'm a professional, I can do this. Because inside you're like, oh my <laughs> God, I want to I run away. <laughs> I can't imagine um, you're singing because I can't sing. So I admire you for doing that because well, <laughs> you've been watching like American Idol or, or any of those shows. They crazy. Some of them and they just come out there and they start sweet singing in front of thousands of people. I'm like, how do you do that? That's amazing. I know. Yeah. No, I couldn't. I could definitely not do that. Um, so you started uh, working in stunts, which was a brilliant segue for you because you had all the knowledge from sport and moved well and you were athletic, are athletic. Uh, and did a little bit of background work and bit by bit you start building your resume which yes. when I look at your I mean your IMDB page has over 222 credits and that's just that that's not your plays and all the other things you've done 
And what's really interesting looking at your body of work is that you have been a part of massive blockbusters, smaller arty things, quirky comedy. You seem to morph very easily from one genre to the other and you've never been typecast. Has that been a conscious decision or has just been luck that it's worked out like that? I think a bit of both, to be honest, but it, yeah. it was a conscious decision. I have always tried to, um, I know at the beginning of my career with the start with Stargate and Outer Limits and some of the other things, you, I, I felt myself, okay, this is where, I, I mean, this is the alley where I think it's going down, but I just tried to be open to other things. Um, I don't mm -hmm. get a chance to do much comedy, which is the one thing I'd like to try. Although I don't know if I'm funny or not, um, but I find it challenging. You are. And <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I find it challenging. So there, you know, there's always ways of, of trying to find different avenues where to go down. So, yeah, I don't know. We're a bit of a conscious decision, but you know what? Uh, as you know, as, as an actor, that sometimes you go where the, where the money is or, or where the gig is, whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm not like a Brad Pitt to pick and choose my career at this stage. You know, now I can have a bit of a say, but still, at the end of the day, I. Yeah go where I get my auditions and where I get my meetings and such. Yeah, exactly. Well, you mentioned Stargate there. So let's start with Stargate. Uh, you are one of the few actors to have appeared in all three series of the franchise. How did you first become involved with the team and with the show? I be became involved with uh, our stunt coordinator, Scott Atia, who mm -hmm. um, was, I played hockey with. And right. This is where some, and he was one of the guys that when I started playing hockey and I was telling him I was getting involved in the film industry, he was the one that said, well, listen, um, you're an ex-pro athlete, you're perfect for this industry. And then when I played with him, he saw that I could skate and I was athletic and thought, well, you know what, you've got to do this. So then he, you know, there's a lot of, a few other stunt coordinators, but at the time he was one of the big influences for me as far as um, working. And then I, he brought me on Stargate and that's how it, yeah. how it started. Yeah. I did Amazing. some background work at first. Um, I think they call it special skills uh, extra. And now it's right. special ability extra or something like that. But yeah, he brought me on as that at first and then to see how I was on set and then eventually started bringing me in for stunt work. Fantastic. I mean, you've played everything from a Russian general, Odai Vetral, a series of Jafar, soldiers, plus <laughs> of course, you're the two that you are probably best known for, uh, Kirik in Atlantis and Varro. Varro? Varro? I don't Varro. know. I would say Varro in uh, Universe. Varro, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You say <laughs> Varro, I say Varro. Um, I know that you've also said Peter DeLuise was quite instrumental in, in getting you work. Uh, and he saw you at a play, is that right? Of yes. Um, and diners? Yeah. yeah, of Diners and Buses. And uh, we, he saw me at a play. And he'd known that I was a stunt guy and... and that I was acting, but I auditioned maybe once or twice for him before that. But after yeah. seeing me in the play, he, he, you know, um, I have to say he came out, we went to, we went to have a few drinks after the play and he just took me aside and said, I need to let you know that you're actually an actor. You're an actor. And I don't know if he remembers that, but, uh, and I said, oh, well, thank you. He goes, no, no, you're an actor. You need to start thinking about acting and, yeah. and, it really, you know, that really sent a message uh, home to me. And I thought, okay, I'm doing the right thing, I think. And, and yeah, things are well, so, but yeah, he was definitely one of the first directors to, to acknowledge that. So I love that. And I love that A, he went to see theater and that you do theater, that you return to the theater whenever you can. I love that. I tried to, you know, it, it, not as easy uh, as it was when, when I was younger, but yeah, I love theater. There's nothing like it. There really yeah. is. Um, yes, on film, there are some times where you have a big audience and, and you have this big moment where everybody's watching you and you have those moments, but in a play, yeah. you know, an hour and a half, two hours, and you're there and there, you know, there's no take two, right? No, exactly. It's a completely different beast, but I think so essential for actors if they can to do both because you yes. just, they both bring different things. Um, so let's start with Kirik then. Why do you think the character affected people so much? Or resonated. Um, I don't know. Maybe yeah, affected the wrong word. Yeah, affected or resonated. Both are good. Um, I think it resonated. Talking to some people was the fact that yes, he was this tough guy, and, and but that he had a, a. They could feel that he was a. He had a caring soul. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that resonates with people because if you're just mean or just tough or just, I don't, you know, people don't always uh, relate to that. But I think with Keurig, that was part of it and, and that he had a caring soul. Yeah. Uh, underlined over all this, you know, brooding toughness. <laughs> uh, so I think yeah. that's, that's yeah, I, th- I think so. Um, I love playing him though. Keurig was one of my favorite characters to play. Well, you did an excellent job. And I think one of the reasons why you are continually cast in these roles is because you're really able to portray very often the human side or the gentler, the more conflicted side of a character that on the page seems to be one thing. And that's, you know, that's that's a talent. Oh, thank you. And I tried to, yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly, humanity. I think it's if you can bring that to a character and it doesn't always work, you try. And sometimes with the writing, you know, you need the writing to work. Yeah. And, and uh, that's where I was fortunate with that. The writing's great and, and directors uh, trusting me to bring that. And um, so I'm glad it worked out. I think it worked out. And I know Keurig led to other things for me within the Stargate universe, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, cause I know there was talk that they were going to bring him back. Yes. And then Atlantis got cancelled, but of course that led to Tavaro, which is great. Um, before before we get on Tavaro, you had this massive smackdown with Jason Momoa, which, yes. I mean, firstly, how long does a sequence like that take to choreograph? Well, uh, our stunt co- uh, coordinator, James Bamford, um, Bam Bam! Bam Bam was, uh, I mean, he's great. And Jason's very, uh, very skilled as well uh, yeah. when it comes to fights. So for us, it you know, we'd rehearsed it a couple times. I think maybe one day rehearsal, not even a full day because he was busy working and, and they brought me on. And um, we worked out, we both have experience. So that definitely makes it uh, yeah. easier. And Jason's great, and and I have to tell you, he embraced me right away and was okay. Let's do this. Let's go. oh, I feel good. You feel good. Feel great, and then move on. Right. You know, yeah. obviously, as That's a awesome. stunt coordinator, he's trying to get us to look as good as we possibly can. But sometimes yeah. you don't have all the time in the world. But it, it worked out well. Well, when I watched it, one of the things that really uh, sort of that I noticed, and I don't know if it was because I was researching you and looking. But I was like, the, the fight looks convincing. Like, I often see fights with actors and you're like, I don't know, that doesn't look, like, he doesn't look like he could handle himself in a bar. Whereas you two, it looked really real. And uh, so, you know, you obviously were doing something right. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, and that's, that goes again to the stunt coordinators and, um, you know, some of my background in, in training for fights and such, being a stunt man definitely helps. And Jason was yeah. great. So. I also noticed that the internet is flooded with odes to your marvelous leather outfit. Your leather outfit seems to have garnered as much interest as the performance. <laughs> so I wondered, like, is costume uh, a, a thing for you, a big deal, or do you not care? Does it does it affect any a performance in any way oh, for you? Absolutely. You put on the, mm. the outfit and, and you feel like that character, right? Especially if it's well done. like. Uh, Valerie Halverson was our um, our costume designer when I was on the Stargate. Uh, all, I think I think all of them, if I remember correctly. And but she always had me in leather, and it was funny because we're like, except when I played the Russian general. But so that became a, a running joke, right? Well, there there's Mike in leather again. There's there's Mike in leather again. <laughs> uh, oh, I love it. Yeah, you know what? Putting on a costume just you embody the character all of a sudden you're you're there and you start to feel how he would move in this and how he you know how he would act and how he feels and i think it's it's critical to a performance yeah absolutely agree so how did varo come your way did you have to audition or did they offer it to you no um i had to audition yes sorry it wasn't an offer it was I knew they they'd been talking to me, and originally at the beginning of you know I was definitely interested in reading for some of the other roles when when it the breakdown started coming out. My agents were putting me up, but they wouldn't see me, and they said because of the Kira character, ironically enough. That and, and I said yeah, but it was only one episode, so I didn't think it was. But they said that episode seemed to resonate, especially with MGM and with the producers. Mm. So they were like, we we like Mike, but. You know, he was on Keurig, I think it's too soon. And then 
I guess is it halfway through the season? I got a call saying we'd love for you to to read for Varl. We, obviously, we have you in mind, but the, the studio and everybody wants to see your your performance, and so I read. Yeah. For it. And, uh, luckily enough, they they liked it, and then they brought me on the last three episodes of season one. I mean, I think it's a testament to both sides, actually, because when Joe Malozzi was on the show, we talked a lot about how um, they all had a kind of ethos to work with people that they just like, you know, because it's so much easier when you're doing long, tricky days to have a great bunch of people. And I think that that is one of the things Stargate has consistently, like, knocked out the park. There is great chemistry between the leads, the recurring, and the guest stars. Absolutely, and and I think that's why everybody likes the show so much. And working on it was fantastic. It, yeah, not many shows where you have so many people, and actually, pretty much everybody liked each other, and, yeah. and got along and respected each other. And if you didn't like somebody, at least you respected them. But there was it was never about any one person. That's the way I felt when I was on the show. It was always okay. Let's get this scene. Let's get the scene done properly. So yeah, yeah, I know, and and. And Joe was, I have to say, Joe Malazzi has always been great with me, so. Oh, we love Joe. <laughs> so do I, he's, he's a, uh, an amazing person and a great friend. And we both grew up in Montreal. And uh, so that's where we, our connection lies. Oh, that's so lovely. That's yeah. really lovely. Um, again, one of the things I loved about Maro and how you portrayed him is that he's so multifaceted because he is a killer fighting a cause. Um, and then there's major chemistry with him and TJ. That must have been a very tough day at the office. <laughs> yeah, Elena sucks, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if only she was talented and pretty, right? Exactly. No, <laughs> She's she so gorgeous. Uh, um, nothing but high praise for uh, Elena, and we're still friends to this day. So, uh, which is which is great. But yeah, she yeah. was fun to work with, and again, it was always about the work and let's do this mm. and let's make it good. And luckily, you know, I, I think chemistry is an interesting thing, right? Um, yeah. You can try to have chemistry, but it doesn't always show on screen. And and I think, I don't know if they were really expecting it at, at, at the beginning. And then it started, because I know, I think Joe mentioned it to me before that I think some of the producers were saying, oh, I don't know if I want that, but they, you know, there is some, chem no, I don't think there's chemistry. And Joe would say, yes, there is chemistry. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> I think it worked out well um, the way it did. Yeah. When you got it, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, I know that you discovered that the show had been canceled, like the majority of the cast on Twitter, which must yeah. have been quite devastating, actually. Um how how do you handle setbacks and rejections when you get well, like a major one like that? Do you do you have any kind of tools or tips that you use? I I think I think now um, you know how they always say just you know get used to it, deal with the rejection, don't worry about it. You're going to get rejected a thousand times as an actor, and fine. But yeah. every once in a while, some of them hurt. Right? They actually sting, and you're like, oh, this sucks. Yeah. And I, I think you got to just grieve that moment, but don't let it take over. I think you grieve that, that day or that afternoon or that, you know, that hour or whatever it is, how, however long it takes. And then you sit there and go, wow, okay, well, that sucks. And then you talk to your friends about it and then you move on, but you have to move on. Yeah. My mom always says, and I love this image, you know, like she says, by all means, take the disappointment, mm -hmm. you know, beat your brow, cry, and then, you know, lick your wounds, but dust yourself off pick yourself up and start again. You just got to get up. That's the thing and keep going. I agree. I think. Um, totally agree. So yay for mums. Yes. <laughs> uh, your sci-fi credits are like off the charts. I mean, you have pretty much been on everything and I'm only going to read a selection here from The Outer Limits, Smallville, Andromeda, Battlestar Galactica, Caprica, Continuum, The X-Files, Arrow, The Strain, Final Destination, and Dark Matter, and Tron Legacy, just to name a few. Um, I wanted to chat very, very briefly about The X-Files uh, because I just wondered what it was like being part of such an iconic show, even though I know you you don't speak in the episode. No, I don't. I know. And yeah. again, that that's a weird thing. So that one was an offer. And... and uh, Chris Carter, I guess, had spoken to the stunt coordinator and said, I need an actor that can actually pull us off, but he's got all this driving to do and fighting. And, and the stunt coordinator said, well, 
Mike Dobin and they're like, well, no, I know him from other stuff, I guess, is the way I'd heard what happened. And no, but he's a stunt guy, he, or he was. And and then all of a sudden it was, I got the call and they said, are you available for these two weeks to do this? And yeah. I said, oh, I don't say anything. And I thought, but then I said, you know what, it's X-Files. And to be part of, of, of such an iconic show, I, I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm so glad I did because I got to spend a lot of time with Chris Carter, which was amazing. And I love to see how, how he works as a creator, as a director, as a mm. producer. And so that was a thrill for me. And then I got to do some fun driving stuff and, and uh, I got to, to choke Gillian Anderson. <laughs> and that's gotta be, I mean, not everyone can say that, although you've had yeah. a few, we'll I know. talk about one of your other moments with another very famous lady. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, it's really interesting, right? Um, you get in these positions, and again, it was literally, I just met Jillian. Yeah. Hi, hi, Mike, Jillian, Jillian, Mike. Okay, so Jillian's on her back, and you're gonna <laughs> straddle, and I'm sitting go, and then she laughed, right? She just looked at her, she goes, hi, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Great. So it was, it was really a funny moment. Um, obviously it's uncomfortable, right. but she was great. So, uh, you know, it's always about the safety of the actor, right? And and yeah, I always feel like I have an idea. I know what I'm doing, but I want to make sure that everybody else is, is comfortable too. So, uh, but yeah, it was a great experience. Yeah, I bet. And, you know, ultimately who cares whether you spoke or not? And also you managed again to bring us a fully fleshed out character like, there's no doubt that he, you know what I mean? Like, immediately I was like, this is amazing. You don't have to talk. You used oh, your acting. <laughs> thank you. No, and I've had people come up to me, oh, you were the driver guy that tried to kill Jill. And I'm sitting there going, wow, really? Because I sometimes you get yeah. a role, like, I just did one of those. I won't say the show. But they called, and they made it sound great. And the offer was great. And I said, awesome, great. And then I got there, and I'm like, I get the yeah. script. Really? This is? Yeah. And it was my own fault for not reading the script beforehand because they didn't have it because it was top secret or whatever. And, and then I got, I'm like, oh, oh, well. But again, you go and do it. And, and I find it's also about the relationships you build working with a director. And I've had a, a director tell me once before, he goes, I know I worked with you and I knew you were good, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> but he goes, I knew, I knew it was good because I had a good feeling about it. So I said, okay, well, that works for me. If you're going to hire me again, I'll take it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, I wanted to chat a little bit about the show Kaya, uh, which aired on MTV. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that process, who you played, uh, and a little bit about the series. Um, the series was basically about this, this, this teen girl who's becoming a big rock star, and I'd mm -hmm. become the manager. Uh, of, of her name is Kaya and I become her manager and then we have a band and this band all of a sudden takes off and we become this big hit but then it goes through all the the trials and tribulations of being a father and being a band manager who doesn't know exactly who doesn't know anything about the music industry just gets yeah. thrown into this and how to deal with teenagers and how to deal with these young young adults right they're all between the ages of 18 and 21 I think at the time so yeah really that interesting been, yeah i was gonna say also an interesting dynamic working with such kind of youthful energy oh those guys were great though they um they came to work read they came ready to to work and our our, our producers should be um uh, should be credited with that because they they were on top of it and they made sure uh yeah. you know savory who I, I still keep in touch with and um she was great and i played her father and she played kaya and and um she's on station 19 the, the new show on oh, okay and uh she was great and she you know she came to work every day and um that's what i liked and that energy there's nothing like that youthful energy yeah and yeah. I really enjoy it. I, I love that show. I really had a good time. I'm just bummed that it didn't go more than one season. But I know that it was at a time when, when MTV was just getting into scripted television and I think they had a shift in, in, in uh, the president of MTV or something shifted. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden we were on, on the way out. But you know what? It was a, one of those amazing experiences. Yeah. Uh, every week since I started the show a year ago, a year and a bit ago, uh, Every week, they're looking at people's work. There is always a surprise or two. And uh, 
as always, there was on your resume as well. And the first one I wanted to chat about was your work on um, Durham County, in which you played Detective Glenn Stuckey. Yes. Now, you mentioned in the past that this role was a challenge because of the way the character was written. Can you elaborate a little more on that? Yes, it was. Um, and this is all through uh, finding out after the show or after uh, some of the read throughs, uh, our table reads and, and trying to figure out this character. And mm. and I had uh, one of our directors um, after the table read said, oh, now I get him. Now I get where, where, where Glenn is. And I was trying to figure out, OK, well, is how bad is he or how good is he He's trying to find that balance of. And I think it's one of those gray areas where some characters live, right? Some people just live in that mm -hmm. gray area. Like they do some good things and then they do some bad things and they feel bad about doing it. And then sometimes they don't feel bad because it was well, just, yeah. like, you know, so for me, it was uh, challenging in that regard to try and bring him to life, but it worked. I think it actually worked. And, and Oh, it absolutely. Worked. It's a great, I mean, the little bits that I've seen of it, I haven't been able to see all of it, but it's really interesting. And I wonder if this was, perhaps uh, fate's way, the precursor of the world being able to, or the casting world, being able to see you play the kind of moral ambiguity of a character so well, because we're not sure. As you said, he lives in that gray area. That's mm -hmm. the best way to say it. Um, and I love that. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, and it was great. And working with Hugh Dillon, uh, who was the lead of Durham County, uh, was great as well, because we would talk about it. And there were times we'd be in a car, you know, we'd have these, cop scenes, quote unquote, uh, yeah. scenes. we'd sit in the car and in between setups, we'd just sit there and talk and throw ideas. And it was, it was really interesting. And the show is quite dark and it really wasn't, there was no time for humor really, you know, it's one of those shows mm. where, and there were times where I tried and directors were like, no, this is real life. It's sad. It's dark. It's the way it is. And that was a valuable lesson because I always try to find, you know, a bit of humor, humanity, so to speak. But in this case, the lack of humor is great because that's what it's, you know, there's some little jokes in the, here and there, but really at the end yeah. of the day, it was about these relationships. And we had six episodes to get this message across. Yeah. So you don't have time to, to fool around. You just have to get to, get to the point, but it, it's beautifully shot. And I am really proud of that series. Yeah. And so you should be. Um, I also wanted to chat a little bit about Grimm, in which you play an assassin, Marnassier, who yeah, morphs Marnassier. into the terrifying mauvaise dante. Yeah. Oh, who was quite terrifying. And you had a rather memorable first encounter with Mary Elizabeth Mastro Antonio, didn't you? Yes. We're, 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 didn't you? I'm trying to remember the story exactly, but it was, uh, you know, here. I'm sitting here and I was, again, that was one of those moments where you meet an actor and you're like, oh my gosh, what? <laughs> I'm meeting yeah. Mary. Um, and it was, again, she's about to kill me. It was another one of those things where she's she's going <laughs> to kill me and I'm trying to get her and and it's, hi, how you doing? Okay, so this is what's going to happen. <laughs> and then, then you shoot the scene and you're like, really? Yeah. That's how you, that's how you like, meet Like, hi, I have to slap you in the face now. I'm yeah. so sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hi there. <laughs> Boom. Let's get into it, I guess. But yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a bummer sometimes, but it is what it is. Scheduling, right? On yeah, of course. Shows, scheduling is such a, an important part of it. So yeah. just deal with it. And How how long did it take to get into that uh, prosthetic makeup? Very long. And so yeah. I did it one day, um, and then they had to get a double for me because we couldn't, it, we had too much, uh, I guess, too many other scenes to shoot. And it was taking away wow. too much time. Like our, my first day was some like 18 hour day, if I remember correctly. And they just wow. decided there's no way we can do that. And they had they had a double just in case, you know, uh, for time constraints. And then they ended up using a double. But yeah, I did have it on that, that one. That was pretty <laughs> cool though. I have to say it was a pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Did you enjoy that yeah. kind of being completely physically submersed in mm -hmm. a character? Yes, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it was he's fun. Kind of scary. Yeah. I know <laughs> evil. He literally was. That's one of those guys. Yeah. That's just an evil. That's what he does. He eats and, and kills people. Yeah. So. <laughs> Which again is a bit of a recurring theme in your career. <laughs> <laughs> um, your that's career it. really, really started to take off during the noughties where you were just seemingly going from job to job to job to job. And not only were you busy in the world of television, but you were also really busy in the world of feature films, which 
uh, you know, is an unusual thing for someone to have a strong, solid TV career as well as the features. And we have to talk a little bit about the making of 300 because I've seen so many interviews with you where you talked about this brutal and difficult diet that you guys had to do. Oh my gosh, yes. And I have to say, you know, the reason I was able to do features and television is basically because of my stunt background and having mm. worked with a and lot of- And your talent. <laughs> well, thank you. But it definitely helped because they put me forward, right? Um, yeah. I was reading for uh, Michael Fassbender ended up uh, playing the role of Stelios, uh, Stelios on uh, 300. And I had read for that like two or three times. And I don't know how serious they were, but I know the stunt coordinator was, is, was very close to the, the, the director, uh, Zack Snyder, Damon Caro. And then they ended up speaking about it and they said, well, we can bring him in as a Spartan and he can do the fight stuff. And, and then we had our diet and then that's how literally I got the job, which was great. And then, uh, yeah, our diet was, it was hard. It was, it was definitely brutal. Challenging. Yes. I mean, uh, like I said, no word of a lie. There were there were times where you know every two and a half hours we would eat. So kudos to Zack Snyder and production because every two and a half hours they would stop filming. You know, obviously get the scene, but then okay, we got to feed the guys. They need to eat. They need to eat. So yeah. and then they come out with a tray by there's some brutal protein shake that had no taste because <laughs> there's no sugar. Nothing had any sugar in. Or yeah. they come out with a, a, a little Dixie cup, a little cup. Uh, of like three grapes and three cubes of cheese, <laughs> like oh tiny cubes, right? Yeah, and the the workouts were absolutely insane. Yes. Oh my god! There's an interview where you're talking about like having to do 150 lunges or something. I was like, what? Um, well, yeah. The I mean, the 300. So there was a 300 where you'd have to do 300 push-ups, 300 uh, squats, oh. 300 all in in wow. succession to try and. And it's definitely based on Mark Jones um, was a CrossFit. And that was the first time I'd heard of CrossFit, the, the term CrossFit, yeah. and we were doing it. And man, those first few days of those workouts were just terrible. I was so sore, I couldn't even believe it. It, yeah. it was, and I thought I play pro sports. Yeah, whatever, whatever workout you got, I can do yeah. it. And all of a sudden, we, you got a, a hundred more squats. I'm like, what? <laughs> the yeah. first two days, I couldn't walk. I remember. I, I did those squats. I think it was, I can't remember if it was 150 or 200 squats on top of everything else, but the squats really got me. And I'd yeah. had some knee surgeries up at that point. So all of a sudden next to my knees swollen, my butt was so sore because <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was um, then the coordinator and that's okay. Let's not go crazy on the training. Now you guys are, are fit. Let's just focus it, yeah. on the fight, it, the fighting and the rehearsals. But then, you put 20 guys in a room together, all that testosterone, and you know they're gonna try, oh, you did, how many did you just do? Oh, okay. Uh, oh, you did 60? All right, let me see. Yeah, I got 62. Like, well, how many did you do, Mike, 62? Oh, okay, I I'm making that. 66. And then, so yeah, that, that testosterone where, where guys try to outdo each other. Yeah, that damn CrossFit. The only CrossFit I know is when you get in Cross trying to get fit. That's about it. <laughs> But I also love that you guys all did it together. So that must have been, you know, taken the sting out of it a little bit. Yes, um, the numbers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you've had quite a lot of physical um, roles, like the Canada Russia 72, Rollerball. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Rollerball was quite tough uh, for you physically. Why was that? It, well, it was, and, and it wasn't, um, how do I get? Put this. It was tough because we were on, on skate rollerblades and, and trying to figure out the game. So we would be mm. hanging off motorcycles, and sometimes, you know, it wasn't a, a proven science. So we're trying to figure out how in this figure eight rink, how to make it work with the banks, and how to really. And then all of a sudden, people and there's no room for errors, right? And sometimes you get too close and on rollerblades, and you're going at 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, and you've right. got to make a sudden turn. And sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. And so um, there were times, some of the falls and a bunch of us got banged up and just, you know, again, it was not knowing how to make this work and how, and that's what happened. And just like playing any sport, you, you watch football or, or any kind of football or, or hockey or anything, it's a high speed and there's going to be accidents and sometimes you're going to hit each other and somebody's going to hurt and somebody's going to break something or, or, and that's what happened a few times, but, but yeah, it was tough. Yeah, I bet. But what a thing. 
what a badge of honor to have got through all that, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it's true. A bunch of yeah. us talk about that, that it was, it was a battle. It was, it was grueling, but we made it. Yeah. And came out the other side. Yes. Um, you have also appeared on massive blockbusters like Deadpool 2, Man of Steel, Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol, and three of the X-Men films. Uh, do you still get nervous going onto a big set like that? Do you, or, or sort of on the first day? Yeah, the first day is always trying to figure it out, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, there's always, um, I don't know if it nerves as much as a bit of anxiety, a bit of, of, of curiosity, trying to figure out, oh, well, I hope I got yeah. this. Yeah, first uh, day of school, right? Yes. <laughs> and I still have that. And I think if you don't have that, then something's missing. I think mm -hmm. when you lose that, then you're you're not excited about it. You're not in that in that you know. And I, that's why I can see people that do television series for five years after you know after a couple of years are like, Ugh, I don't want to do this anymore. And and you lose yeah. that. Um, I can understand it, but I still think it's our, it's the greatest job in the world. So yeah, for me going to a movie set, especially a feature, you can do, and look the scopes of these big features, and you see some of the the set decoration, and you see the big stages and it's massive it's beautiful and you're just like oh my gosh this is what this is why i am doing this yeah i mean that's got to be a good day at the office when you're like walking on to x-men or deadpool 2 just be like what oh yeah deadpool 2 that prison sequence was so amazing uh unreal outstanding and to see it it looked just as good you know how sometimes yeah. it looks great on film and you're like uh, no this looked fantastic Oh, amazing. So in 2013, you had a slight departure acting wise from anything you'd done up until this point when you were cast as a suave French playboy in the <laughs> series Mistresses. And it was a different role for you in that there was no um, physical stuff and we got to see the romantic lead side. Um, did you yeah. enjoy your time on the show? Absolutely. Um, it was so, it was challenging in a sense that. Oh, people have never seen me like this, really. So in that regard, you start to think, well, I hope it works. And But they did. I, I think I was only supposed to do a couple episodes, and then they brought me on for the rest of the first season. And yes, and, and working with Jess McCallum was great. And our producers were were fantastic. They, um, I'm glad they took a chance on me. And I think it, it, it worked out really well. Uh, but it was fun to play. It definitely was. It was so interesting because at the end of the day, you just, oh, I'm done. I don't have to go and, and rehearse a fight scene or I don't have to go do this. Yeah. I don't have to rehearse a driving sequence. And so that was nice. It definitely, <laughs> yeah, that was really nice to, to just focus on the work and do it. Yeah. And, okay, we're done. Here you go. And another string to your bow. And you had a, um, a real kind of pinch me moment during that show. Uh, do you remember, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, no. When oh, you were, yes. you said you were oh. in San, so if you share that oh, with us about, Boulevard. oh my gosh, yeah. yes. one of those iconic that. moments, and as, as an actor, and you've watched movies and, and TV shows and whatever, you know, you always think of, oh, being in Hollywood on Sunset Boulevard, you know, in a suit or dressed in some yeah. wardrobe, walking down with a beautiful woman and having an awesome car, beautiful, <laughs> exotic vehicle, and it happened, I was, there was a sequence, and we had, I think it was two or 300 background, uh, right on Sunset wow. Boulevard. I'm driving a DeLorean as I pull up, get out of the car, and pick up Jess McCallum, who, who, who played uh, Joss on the show. And she's on my arm, and I'm walking, and people are, like, looking at us, watching. And I said, oh, my God, this is it. This is one of those moments where I've made it, right? I, yeah. I'm, I'm in Hollywood, literally, on Sunset Boulevard. In a DeLorean. A in a DeLorean. I know, right? Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, you had a French accent for that, didn't you? Yes. Do you like working with an accent? I mean, it must Sometimes. be massively helpful being fluent in three languages. <laughs> yeah, definitely it helps. And it, you know, um, for Olivier, I, I pictured him being uh, as, uh, you know, this French person that I, I knew and he had been in, in North America for, I guess, 20 years, but he had that specific French accent, the stereotypical where he's like, I'm not going to change for anybody, you know? This is me. Yeah. This is how I am. This is, and I thought, my God, that's Olivier, right? 
<laughs> I know there were times where some, and then some French people were like, well, it knows too much. And I said, listen, did you watch, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the Academy Awards, the, the, uh, the director that was nominated for uh, The Father. Um, oh, you, yes. I, um, oh, I, I can't remember his name, but I know exactly who you mean. And, and halfway through, I caught, I walked in the room and I, and I saw his, his, um, it was speech when he was talking about Anthony Hopkins. And I'm like, oh my gosh, see this, there you go. This was a typical yeah. French accent that, you, you know, and there's so many French people that don't speak that way when they speak in English. But I felt like Olivier was, and then ended up after the first couple episodes, then it was great. It was fine. But it was really interesting to see how, how every region has a different accent. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, just like, you know, I'm originally South African and nothing irritates me more than when I see South Africans being portrayed on the television block. This and they can't really do the accent. And it sort of sounds Australian and a bit British. Oh, oh and I'm gosh. like, no, there isn't just one South African accent. People have an absolute variety of accents in the country, just like the US, just like Canada, yes. just like France, you know. <laughs> so, um, but half fab, I mean, I, God, I'd love to work to something with an accent. I want to play Russian, even though I'm not Russian. I want to play Russian. Oh, yeah, but you could play it. You'd kill it. I could be. We could be killers together. I like it. Perfect. Let's do it. <laughs> Malazzi. Right. Malazzi. Yeah, so I'm just going to say, know some people. speaking we of Malazzi, yeah. yeah, you were reunited with Malazzi and some of the other Stargate, alum Stargate? Stargate alumni when you worked on uh, Joe and Paul Mully's Dark Matter. He yes. played Arex Nero, who is a uh, criminal and gang leader. Now, did you have to audition for this one, or did they I did. kindly offer it to you? I did. Oh, they make you work. They do. Um, yeah, it's an interesting story about that one. But, yes, it, it – um, I can't remember how that – for Eric. How, yeah, I had to audition for it. Yeah. And uh, – but, you know, it is what it is. A lot of times it's the studios um, – and that's why it's funny when you do get offers sometimes you're thinking, well, wait a second. They, you just offered me this great role and, and, but all the other, like other roles that were much lesser roles, you didn't even, yeah. you're making me audition like three times for it. Yeah. You know? Right. <laughs> but anyway, our industry is crazy. So, I, you know, I'd love, love to get offers all the time, but it doesn't happen much. So you have to audition. It's the necessary. Yeah. Piece. It's a yeah, necessary. It's yeah. Exactly. It's part of the beast, you know, um, part of the whole thing. Um, so did you, is there a sense of like working with family when you come onto a show like that? Cause you guys have been, had worked together before so often. Oh, absolutely. Or throughout yes. the years. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and that's what makes it great. You, you're excited to go to set because you know, yeah. you know what it's gonna, going to be like, and you know that it'll be a collaboration. You'll be able to talk about things. You'll be able to create the character without, trying to, you know, um, navigate the waters, so to speak. So, okay, well, I can't talk too much to this person because you'll get to, you know, uh, you know, some actors don't like to talk, some do. Mm -hmm. And so there's always a, a, an interesting thing, but, and some, most producers, though, I've been very fortunate. People are pretty cool with me. I've never really had any issues, so. I think, again, looking at your work, preparation is something that comes up. You, It's key to you, and I wondered, mm -hmm. Do you like working from the outside in to a character or like, do you start with say the voice or the accent or what's on the page or a bit of both different for each one? Sometimes it's reading it and then trying to, trying to come up with something like uh, I'll read it, read it. And what comes to my mind? What's he like? <laughs> I just keep asking myself, what's this person like? What is he? What is, yeah. he? What is he? What? And literally I just keep asking myself that. And then I try to figure out how would he stand? How would he, how would he move? Where does he think from? Where, do, where does it come from? And so for me, that's really where, you know, and, and look, some characters you have to develop and it takes a lot of work. And some characters you sort of, well, it's my wheelhouse. I think I know this guy. I can feel it. Okay. And yeah. You it, yeah. Um, during the time that you were doing Dark Matter, you auditioned, you had to audition for Hallmark, who thought that you might not be soft enough for Hallmark. So how did you go about convincing them? Well, Martin Wood, ironically enough, a director. Ah, Martin okay. Wood. Yeah, lovely Martin. I remember reading for it and, and um, I'd read for one of the series regulars earlier and, and Carl um, Binder was, was there and he's like, uh, I don't know if I should say this, but oh, what the hell. Um, he was like, you know, they, 
you're not quite the uh, soap opera handsome that they you've got an right. edge. To you. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's that's fine. That's that's who I yeah. am. That's not me. The soap opera handsome is not me. And so, uh, and then again, when I, I had another chance to play Roy McAfee, and finally when they did cast me, um, it was they were like, okay, so I know he was a SWAT team commander before, but you know, it's really this is Hallmark, and it's more. I said. Well, Martin, I'm an actor. Just let me. I can smile. I can do this. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> and he let and we laughed about it, and then it was it, it ended up being fine. But yeah, but there was some concern, I guess. And I don't know if it was because somebody had seen me in playing a killer or something like that. Somebody had seen me play. Yeah. And then, oh, I can't see him as this, but it ended up working out in my favor. But yeah, it's, that's what happened, though. Yeah, it's and Hallmark has a, a really like slavish devotion um, fans. I mean, it must have. <laughs> broadened your fan base even more. Yes, absolutely. And especially through social media, right? They um, yeah. they do touch base and uh, yeah, so definitely lucky. And I'm glad they liked, uh, I don't do many Hallmark things, but every once in a while I, I, I get an opportunity and it's great. Yeah. And I think Cedar Cove was, uh, mm -hmm. when Terrell was on the show, we talked about that. I mean, it's such a beautiful place to film. So it must've been just a lovely job to be a part of. Yes, I think I think with those Hallmark and Cedar Cove was one of those shows where uh, I think just being present and literally just taking in the scenery and, and the actors and it is Hallmark. It's not deep. You're not going to go into nobody's a drug addict or an alcohol really to that extent yeah. of some of the movies that I've done. So you don't have to dig as deep to find your character. I don't think. I think a lot of times you you just sit there and you be present and listen and. And that definitely helps, uh, and not for all Hallmark, but I'm just saying for me, for some of them that I've done, it seems yeah. like just be there, be, it's okay, you know, that's. Yeah, exactly, just just do it. <laughs> it's okay to just be, it's okay to just be, not easy, but for, for things to be simple. Yeah, yeah. Um, the second surprise for me on your resume was your fantastic turn as Coco in Mr. D. I mean, you really can do comedy. And I wanted to know how much of Coco, I mean, if anyone hasn't seen this, you can get this episode on YouTube. And it's just brilliant because you're this like hardened drug dealer, but sort of with tattoos and everything, but obsessed with your dog. It's like such yeah. a clever. The big puppy and then love. It's, just, it's like puppy love, I mean. <laughs> And it's properly funny. Um, oh, thank you. No, that was, that, yeah. Oh, it was Jerry okay, D, who was the star of the show. Uh, and we did Canada Russia 72 together. And we'd ah, always stay in okay. touch. And he thought, he said, oh, what can I use with Mike that could be like, you know, he's a tough guy, or he's this, he's that. And, you know, and we could use it maybe like a, a, an action. They tried to make it a bit like the, the TV show 24. You know, they tried to steal some. <laughs> Got with the yeah. split screens and uh, yeah, we did with it, and it was fun. That you look, comedies are so great because you're always they're harder than they seem, right? Uh, shooting a comedy is oh, yeah. a lot of work as, as far as, and especially I respect like Jerry D. He'd come in with twenty different ways to play the scene and, and different things. So that was it was good for me to see that as well, and and how uh, this doesn't work. And then they try, they try, they try to find something that works, and it's not. Sometimes it's just in the spur of the moment, and you oh, this is what works. You know this yeah. line, or and so did you guys uh, improvise at all? Oh, on yeah, the show or was it here? Jerry does. Jerry has his his, but he did, and then we, you know, we improvised a few things. But for the most part, it was, yeah, it was on script. I I would think, I remember correctly, I think it was. But yeah, definitely moments of impro improvisation, and yeah, and Jerry's so great and so smart that he would know as soon as he'd say, "No, I don't like it." Like, can we go again? I I, I didn't like the way that came out, or I didn't and. Okay, I think that's better. Wouldn't it be funny if I did? You know, he was—he's always yeah. thinking. It was—it was pretty, pretty cool to see. But it was fun to well, shoot. It's terrific, and I really hope comedy is in your future a bit more because you just played it with just the right amount of. It's quite deadpan, and and as you said, that split screen thing works so brilliantly, and the kind of ransom phone call when yes. you've got this poor guy holding him ransom, and his best friend couldn't care less. He's like, "Dude, you're not yeah, going to get money out of me." Yeah. <laughs> I've been on like five buses. I'm like, fine. 
Well, I'm almost at the end of my questions because I know you have to go and pick up your lovely daughter from school. So before we talk about three of your most well-known villains, I mean, it's very clear talking to you that you are not only a delightful man and a family man and you're passionate about life and seem really settled in your career and your life. So how, how is it that you play these really evil characters so convincingly like what do you tap into for that oh that's that's a great question um and it's funny because uh i had to go uh pick up uh some prescription medication yesterday for my mother-in-law um and i was at the pharmacy and the pharmacist oh she goes oh i know you <laughs> <laughs> even with my you know the mask on yeah and, oh okay great and she goes why do you always play these bad people why do you always play mean people i i've seen you before i know you're a nice person i hear you're a nice person but i'm like <laughs> because it's acting it's it's acting so you know what i love about it to be quite honest is that you delve and i read you know i've read books on, on different characters especially like sociopathic killers and such and yeah. criminals and you, and you read and I used to work nightclubs and I've seen criminals and and so you know you can sense their vibe and you can feel a lot of who they are and I've dealt with a lot of these people so I draw on that and then I try to create a character and I always try to find some humanity in, in the character if I can but it's really mm -hmm. It's, I mean, it's a lot of work to try and find what works. How do I play this guy? How do I make him not, not just a, a one note villain, right? You're always trying to find yeah. different things. So yeah, you always, <laughs> I grasp a straw sometimes trying to figure out, oh, is this gonna work or not? But I think you have to risk. Absolutely. And I would say certainly Victor in Arrow, Vincent in the 100, and uh, of course, most recently, Jason Micic, um, who's the Serbian gangster in power. I mean, all three of them, very different beasts, but you bring exactly that. There's a, um, a duality and kind of nuance uh, to the character. It's not just all one shade. Thank you. So, yeah, you know, and that goes to sometimes the creators of the show. And mm -hmm. and I've been very fortunate where they, they tend to trust me and trust my choices. And um, unless it's something like with The 100 was basically... They basically said, go, go for it, do, do your thing. And I did, and then I was worried because I didn't hear anything from anybody at first for a while. And right. nobody said and I'd talked to a director afterwards, uh, you know, like a year later. He said, oh no, we were told, don't talk to Mike, let him do his thing, don't direct, don't over direct him, just let him be right. his He's, and, and so that I was like, okay, great. Cause I didn't know, do they like it or not? Is this working? But- uh, Oh, yeah. it works. Vincent is so, creepy and on more than one occasion reminded me very much of Hannibal Lecter and not just because he keeps the feet and the hands and eats them but you had a kind of um a stillness which is both really appealing but terrifying because you it's that kind of thing of like this person could slice my face off but while they're having a nice normal conversation was that a conscious choice yes absolutely um I really wanted my speech pattern to not be too quick. Everything is he's taking in everything as he speaks. Um, that mm. was one of the things I wanted uh, with the producer. We, 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 we discuss about the glasses and at first I didn't want them. And he, and then he thought some glasses. and I said, Oh, how about, Oh, if we're going to do glasses and how about like glasses that maybe somebody that I had killed before that were too small for me. Yeah. And, Oh, that would work. And then, so the, yeah, def definitely his speech was very deliberate. Um, and you know what, for Vincent was literally that demon that he talks about. Uh, yeah. About that demon coming out. So when that came out, that was a whole different person. That was the demon. But then besides that, he's, he's a great guy, except for the demon. <laughs> you, I mean, it, it really, it's worth watching just because I, I obviously haven't seen the entire series. I sort of submerged myself in your work. <laughs> I feel like I know you really well. <laughs> like eight days of just like watching Thank all your you. work. <laughs> um, but I have to have to talk to you about Power, which is just mm. exceptional. We've actually started watching it now because I said to my husband, this is right up your alley. I mean, you know, it's very violent, but it's really good. And I know you said that Jason Mitchich is probably your favorite character that you've played so far. And you had a little hand in creating him, didn't you? 
I think so. Yes. Um, he, I look, Serbians are often portrayed just as, um, you know, gangsters and off the, you know, they fly off the handle and they're, they're crazy. Mm. And, this and, that. and I just thought, no, I know, sir, I'm Serbian. I'm not crazy every time. And so I wanted him to be, I wanted this to be, he's a businessman. Yeah. Regardless yeah. if he was selling, uh, uh, <laughs> toilet seats or if he was selling, you know, cars or if he was selling, um, drugs, it's yeah. the same thing. And just don't cross them. Things are done a certain way. And, and I thought that's what Jason was. So that's, that was what I tried to bring to Jason and, um, and the fact that, you know, that he's Serbian and, and, uh, our, our, uh, costume design too was great. Cause they, they didn't want him to be Euro trash. They wanted him to be stylish, but, yeah, have more of a, a business appeal, but like a European business uh, appeal to them. So, and, and that was great. So that was a collaboration too. And, and with Courtney Kemp and Gary Lennon, our showrunners um, and creators of the show, they were they were great with uh, my input. And again, you know, once we discuss it, and they let me run with it. And I think it was originally supposed to be only only like three episodes. So, that oh turned. well, yeah, that turned out well, and definitely seemed to solidify your leading man status, but also bad boy image, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, yeah. It, it, I loved working. Obviously, it was, um, again, a slight departure from, from the sci-fi genre and, and such. So it was, um, I like those dark, gritty shows. I tend to gravitate towards those and as far as a fan. So yeah. it's, always great. it's always great working in those uh, in that environment. Well, I um I still had a few things I wanted to talk to you about, but I know because we're kind of pressed for time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor to questions. Uh, and I wanted to ask you just before we take the first question, I mean, you've done pretty much everything in the last 20 years. What is on your bucket list in terms of roles? You said more comedy, which I definitely think you should do. Wow. Uh, that's so such a hard question because it changes, right? Every yeah, of course. While it changes. I sit there and I go, and you know, I used to say, you know, it'd be fun to try and do a romantic comedy, right? Would be fun yeah. to try and do. Uh, that's still one of them. That's still one of the bucket list things, I think. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Hello, I'd like yeah. to do a romantic comedy. Yes. See, <laughs> see? we could be Russian <laughs> killer romantic. Never. <laughs> yeah, Joe. <laughs> But yeah, I think that's maybe one of those that would be fun to try. Um, yeah, and you know, I'd love to just, you know, it'd be interesting to be on the series for five years. You yeah, know, um, right. for obvious well, reasons, but I, to, and, and again, to, to, to create, and, and to, I think creating a series would be something that I would love to do. Oh gosh, yeah, well. Let's hope that from your lips to the God's ears, uh, and let's see that that happens and comes to fruition. Um, because I, I'm so delighted that your career continues to go from strength to strength. You just, uh, you're talented and just a lovely guy. So oh, I wish you yeah. all the best. You're the best. <laughs> you. My pleasure. So very quickly, before we let you go, which hockey team do you support? Oh, um, I am a Montreal Canadiens fan. First and there foremost. There you go. Yeah. Are uh, the heads I, I can read that. Uh, oh, my gosh. You know, I think they have the potential to. I really hope they do. They've got to shore up their defense. But I think once in the playoffs, anything can happen. Uh, right. Somebody wrote this question in. After a hard, jo hard job, well done. What do you do for fun? Oh, um, one of my favorite things when a show is done is I enjoy celebrating it with either uh, a margarita with my wife and, that, and a margarita and maybe some chicken wings. That's one of the Ooh, things. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I do because usually you know the roles I tend to play. I'm always watching what you know, exercising, watching what I eat. So that's one of the things I'd love to do. Uh, one of my favorite things that that we love to do. I love that. That's such a lovely little cap, you know, to end a, a, a production on. So. Um, yes. Somebody else has written in saying, hey, Mike, out of all the characters you've played on SG-1, Atlantis, and Universe, which one did you find the most fun to play? I think you sort of answered that. But Well, yeah, Varro obviously was great, but Kirik was, was um, 
I mean, Ode I Ventrell was crazy. It was fun to do that too. Uh, Kirik would have been, I would have liked to have expanded on Kirik's character a little more to see where he would yeah. have, where that would have gone. Well, who knows? Maybe in the, the next one. Uh, and then uh, the last two questions come from Patricia, who says she knows you quite well. So the questions are, what do you do in your spare time besides put up Christmas lights and renovate your yard? <laughs> uh, well, obviously, kids. Um, I, I coach my 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 son in, in hockey and football. Um, I try to help out with my daughter and her soccer, and so so my kids, my family. That's the one thing I do. As soon as I'm home, that's that's my number one priority. Uh, and I enjoy I enjoy playing hockey still. I still play hockey. So uh, we have a group of us uh, guys that we've known each other for over 20 years. So yeah, that's one oh. of the things I still, I still enjoy doing. That's so great. And the final question is, have you ever tried to be anonymous at an event? And if so, what does that look like? <laughs> well, now it's easy, right, with the masks. Although every once in a while, I'm surprised people recognize me. Everyone yeah. with a mask on. Um, I can go about and do do my things, no no problem. Um, <laughs> and where we, you know, our, our place here in, in Tawasin is, is pretty easy, straightforward. Everybody knows me, so <laughs> they're like, yeah, whatever, it's just Mike. So I'm, I'm just part of the community here, which is great. Um, but yeah, I, it's easy for me to go unnoticed, I think. Yeah, I think you have one of those things, again, it's your versatility that if you choose to be seen, you can be seen, but you can right. also kind of like blend into the background. I can blend into the background for it, yeah. Every once well, in a while. I don't know about, yeah. yeah. I don't know about blending into the background. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for giving us your time. I mean, I would have loved to have talked to you more about Project Eden, which I know you worked with, with our yes. beloved friend. Um, but also, and, and 2047 uh, virtual revolution, revolution was it? No. Yes, which yeah. just looks amazing. But we'll have to have you back in a part two to talk about the next uh, five or six years. <laughs> I love that. Yes, such a great time talking to you too, Sue Ann. Um, but definitely, yeah, anytime, I'm in. Oh, well, that's, thank you. I really appreciate that. And thank you again for taking the time of your day. Uh, I wish you all the best on your next projects and coming up. Have you got anything that you can tell us about coming up? Uh, yes. Um, there is a series I did for Sci-Fi Network called Day of the Dead. Based right. on the 1985, 86 movie. I can't remember. I should know that. but um, And uh, I believe it'll be coming out in October, September or October. October would be great because of Halloween and, and all that. And that yeah. was one of those series we did. We did 10 episodes. And uh, I played Detective McDermott on that. And uh, it was a fun, really well written. Uh, our showrunners were, were, were great. Um, Scott Thomas and Jed Elenov. And uh, really well written and fun. Yeah, fun show. I think you guys will enjoy it. Excellent. Well, we can't wait. And thank you so much again. Have a wonderful afternoon. Good luck with all of the things you have yes, to do yes. and school Great. runs and stuff like that. Real life takes over. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm so sorry that uh, we didn't get to everyone's questions. Unfortunately, we've been a little bit pressed for time tonight. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and, and Mike, I so appreciate that. Again, please spread the word of this uh, show and these interviews, because if we can keep the Stargate love alive, then that'll make me a very happy goddess. Uh, please join me next week when David Nickel will be in the hot seat. I can't wait to see you all then. Have a fabulous week, everyone. Lots of love. Good night.